look, if I'm going to spend a great portion of this life, yeah. you and I only have so many breaths, mm -hmm. and if I'm going to spend a lot of them working, then I'm going to be in a culture and an atmosphere that I love. Yeah. And I want to cultivate it. If I'm going to ask somebody to give their life a good portion of their life, I mean, mm -hmm. let's be honest. Like, if you take how much people, how much time people spend at work, yeah. versus play, versus home, versus sleep, everything else, a good portion of their life is spent working. Majority. So majority. So if I'm going to ask somebody to do that, then I'm going to create a culture that at the end of their days, they say that was a life well lived. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Sales Wolves podcast. This is episode 71. I'm your host, Tyler Harris. I thought I was the host. <laughs> co host. <Joseph> Caldwell. <laughs> we are co people. <laughs> co host. He's my co life partner. <laughs> host. <laughs> Something like that. Something. This is episode 71, and we are the Sales Wolves. Yes, we are. Uh, Your dog's probably going nuts. I forgot that no, he's he sitting right there. And we have a third code host, which if we could pan down, which we can't, uh, there is a puppy. You would us. see that Thor. That is the company dog. His Our name sweet is Thor. little Thor. He's snoozing. He had a rough morning of play. Dude, speaking of Thor, I did legs for the first time two nights ago, yeah. like hard, and then I ran five miles you yesterday. Like I can God hardly of... walk. I am Tho Thor. You're Tho Thor? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were <laughs> elevated to the level of the God of Thunder. Oh, uh, no. Just hurting. This is episode I 71. I thought you were going to say no, just Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> just Hercules. Just a her, not a he. Um, <laughs> this is episode 71, and in this episode, we're going to talk about uh, culture. And as we were kind of preparing for this episode, we realized it's not the easiest thing to talk about because no. it's largely intangible. Right. But if created in the right way, can be kind of, I guess, palpable would be the better word sure. when people are around it or mm -hmm. when people are experiencing it for the first time, like in person, live, sure. uh, which we experienced that. We had one of our uh, boot camp trainings that we do uh, every so often. We have our new agents that are from all across the country come in to our office and it's a a full, full, like Friday evening, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, uh, kind of drinking from a, a fire hose. Uh, but they're able to really kind of feel some of this kind of family atmosphere yeah. and, and culture that, that Joseph has built within our organization. And uh, it's interesting, as they left, every single one of them, that was their biggest takeaway. It was, wow, like, like you hear it on the webinars, you hear it on, on Voxer, which is a communication app that we use. Um, you read about it, you're told about it, but until you actually get here and experience it, True. you're still kind of like, ah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just, they're all left blown away and completely yeah. bought in at that point. Sure. Um, and so one thing I wanted to start with, there was this Deloitte's uh, 2016 Global Human Capital Trend Report, and it said that 86% of their respondents viewed corporate culture as important or very important to business success. However, even though so many believe their co company's culture is key, only about 12% said that they actually um, knew or understood, actually, let me scratch that, let me start over. However, even though so many believe their company's culture is key, only about 12% said that their company is driving the right culture, and 28% said that they understood their organization's culture. So you've got 86% are saying corporate culture is the key to success. Yep. Only 12% are saying that their company is driving the right culture, and only 28% say they even understand. That's the so bigger one. I would say that's a fairly big gap. It's, I would it, say yeah, that's, that's a, a problem. Uh, implementation gap. Yeah. Um, so in other words, we know that this thing we call culture is an important part of building a successful enterprise, but we're not sure how to make it better or really even what it is. Right. And so that's what we want to talk about today. Um, Joseph can give you some of the insight of what it was like coming up with the culture, because that's the thing that like, a culture has to be created. Mm -hmm 
from the inception, but then once it's created, it has to be cultivated and developed over daily. time, and it has to be communicated right. on a daily basis. Um, so we'll kind of jump into that. Um, you want to kind of kick that off and just kind of in the very beginning how really you had a blank canvas, yeah, and you had to decide what did we really want. Um, you know, it's fascinating talking about this because a lot of people come into our company and experience the culture in the office and from guests to people that work here to our agents that are in the field and everybody gets the same thing, right? Yep. So something about culture is whatever your culture is, it's got to be consistent. Yeah. And when you create that, you just have to determine what type of company you want. So I, I remember, sorry, I remember, I remember sitting and thinking that um, how, how Google did their culture, you know, they had the nap pods and all the fun yeah. stuff and yeah. all that kind of thing. And I thought, well, I want to have a fun atmosphere. And so it was loosely. Did you learn that on that movie, The Intern? The Intern, yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> like, but they had unlimited food. Fist me. And they were. <laughs> Found me. <laughs> get, put it, get seriously, get, get fist me. Get up in there, bro. Get up in there, bro. <laughs> <laughs> we're just going to put it on the line. Um, but we. It's we, we, uh, a great movie. It's a hilarious movie. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I thought, man, we get, you got to. Look, if I'm going to spend a great portion of this life, yeah. you and I only have so many breaths, mm -hmm. and if I'm gonna spend a lot of them working, then I'm going to be in a culture and an atmosphere that I love, Yeah, and I wanna cultivate it. If I'm gonna ask somebody to give their life a good portion of their life, I mean, mm -hmm. let's be honest, like if you take how much people, how much time people spend at work, yeah versus play, versus home, versus sleep, everything else, a good portion of their life is spent working. Majority. So majority. So if I'm going to ask somebody to do that, then I'm going to create a culture that at the end of their days, they say that was a life well lived, mm -hmm. right? And so that was how we, we came at it, Jeff and Nathan and myself, um, in the very beginning. And it started with just us. Mm -hmm. And it started with... Um, you know, we you hear that that uh, saying, families that eat together stay together. Yeah. But we started. You know how we do our whole company, and we have a meal together, and we all mm -hmm. come up with ideas and stuff like that to yeah. to further the bottom line and yep. and and have everybody engaged. Well, that started with me and Jeff and Nathan. Yeah. Like it was. It's not something that we thought one day. Oh, this would be cool because we want to make people feel special, but not really give them any. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because companies have have this. Um, they hear these ideas and they're like, oh, let's implement that. Yeah, let's check Be that box. Let's check that box because we'll get more productivity out of the person. Hmm. Yeah. Because they give a shit more about the bottom line than they do actually about the individual. If they feel important versus are important, yep. then they think that that's the same outcome and results and productivity. Right. But and it's not, not because, because anybody can see through that over time. Yeah. They can see through that they're not important. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was, uh, that was one of the things as we brought people along. We wanted them to feel the, how valuable they were. And so uh, a lot of times that took explaining why their job was so important. Yeah. Because legitimately, if you, take the, if you take the janitor in, in a huge corporation, their job is vital, oh, yeah. vital. I can literally sit down with that janitor and change his life by explaining to him. The CEO can sit down with the janitor and explain how what he does on a daily basis ties back to the company's mission, vision, oh, yeah. and values. I mean, they might as well be like the director of first impressions. I, I know. <laughs> if somebody go, if somebody, yeah. if a guest comes in here. And, and we have everything's all great, but they go in the bathroom and it's the smelliest, nastiest place on earth. Mm -hmm. That's like that's like when I used to be when I used to lend money, right? Yeah. And I would lend money on cars, and 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 you know you can look at the credit report and it may look okay. You can look at the person and they may smell nice and dress up <laughs> nice, but the real test is walk past their car yeah. and look in the back seat. Yeah. I, I'm telling you, it's how McDonald's they McDonald's wrappers and it, please don't tell the story about the one thing you saw. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Up, but. but anyway, 
<laughs> that right there, it's a telltale, yeah. right? Oh yeah. And and you can you can look at that person because they don't have it together right now. Mm -hmm. They don't have it together right now. They how they're going to treat this one is how they're treating that. It's the how you do anything is how you do everything. Is how you do everything, yeah. right? And that includes and so it really has to start from the top. It has yeah. to start from the inception. And if there's a company that doesn't have it, then you have to get your your key people and your direct reports, and you've got to lay the law down on the company culture or the mm -hmm. company mission, vision, and values first. Um, I sat in a meeting one time, and this was about two years into the business, and somebody said, well, what's your mission, vision, and values? And I was like, well, this is what we do. Yeah. And they were like, no, no, no. And they put my feet to the fire. So and how I, long ago was that then that you, that was, that you put those things in place? Because it was before I came. We, yeah, before. It was six years ago, okay. five years ago. Got just like a year before. Yeah. Yep, five years ago. Yeah. Right around there. And I went, oh my gosh. It started with me and Jeff and Nathan. We knew. Yeah. Because yeah, we yeah. got together and we talked about it and we, we walked through everything together and mm -hmm. we, we had fun together. We played together. We got our families together. Yeah. Um, we knew how, Nathan knows how much I value him and his the role he plays and Jeff knew how much we valued him and the role he plays. And, but we it wasn't permeating through the first couple employees. Okay. And they just didn't know. Yeah. So in what we do, we have a retention department, right? And, and, and we have salespeople. The two were disconnected. Mm -hmm. So one sold the business, one retained it. <laughs> and the two had no idea how the other one did anything. Yeah. And so they didn't appreciate it nor respect it. And so, and, and so, therefore, if my goal is for that person to really feel valued, then everybody else in the company has to value them. Yeah. And so it's, it's not like you can wave a wand one day mm -hmm. and create culture. No. It is not an easy thing to do. And we have a freaking unicorn here. Yeah. But it's because we took two little unicorn embryos and got those things to <laughs> <laughs> raise yeah. them up and, yeah. and, and, and created it, right? So, yeah. so a couple of things that, that just come to my mind, and, and I love how you said it's guests that come into our office because you're right. Like, it's not just employees and our agents. Like, I think back to when Sean sat through Top Gun and that Sean first Whelan, dinner, yeah. Sean Whalen. And after that first dinner, like he had, he had, he had already put together kind of what he was going to talk about in the six-hour workshop the next day. But after just sitting through our awards banquet um, that night, he was like, "Oh my gosh!" Like, I can't even really explain what I just witnessed. But it's so different and so unique and so palpable. He was like. We we're gonna hang out afterwards. He's like, I got to go to the room because I got to pretty much rewrite what we're doing tomorrow yeah. based on what I just witnessed. Because this is an insurance company at the end of the day, right? And they just had an awards banquet celebrating sales success, and no one talked about insurance. No one talked about really even numbers, and no one talked about money. Right. And it was all about these values that we have, and all about legacy, and all yeah. about. Um, just celebrating individuals um, for things that didn't have to even do with their sales, like right. with the Mike Williams Award and things yep. that he was able to witness. And just the fact that he was able to witness a whole room of people where people were getting emotional oh, yeah. throughout. Uh, and that it wasn't just competition-based stuff. Yep. And, and it's awesome to sit back, like, you know, I've been here for four years now, for me to sit back and see that through someone's eyes for the first time again. Yep. And, and you, you, cause you, for, you forget like how special it really is until you see someone, especially someone that has very, um, very strong views on oh, yeah. everything, be able to look at something and be like, no, this is very special, That's, which was awesome to see. Uh, but one thing I think that has led to that is the fact that everything that you do within our organization and the culture that you've built, it's very unapologetic. Yeah, yeah. And now you take if you if you don't stand for something, yeah. you fall for anything, right? Absolutely. So we took certain stances on things, mm -hmm. and we don't apologize for those. Yes, yeah. and, um, and you want to align with people that that, that believe the same that thing. believe the same thing, yeah. and that and that I think because I'm I'm imagining the person that's watching this that their company does not have that culture, right? Um, and how we can help that person develop that culture, and it's like you said, like this is your company. And when it's your company, you want to set up this culture to where, like you said, that you just 
enjoy, yeah. that you, the way you want to live, and the way you want to go about every single day, and the legacy that you want to leave behind, like you created that, like you can create that. And then once you've created it, then you can attract others that fit into that mold and not really care about those that don't right? because they are going to become a cancer if they don't sure. fit into the mold that right. you've uh, created. And so finding those people that do align with your mission, vision, and values, and then when you find those people, like, it's... You and can see, do anything. And a lot them. of companies, though, they have a lot of people that align with their mission, vision, and values, but the company has gotten so detached from the individual. Yeah. Every single person is a human. Mm -hmm. And they have loves and likes and hates and wants and desires and they have hurts and pains and and they have a history and a past and all that comes with them into the company. Yeah. And if they don't know that you care more about them mm -hmm. than anything else, yeah. they're gone. They're gone. It doesn't matter if you have the greatest mission, vision, and value on earth. If you don't care more about um, the person, you know, yeah. old saying, uh, people don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. If 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 that's not part Dude, that of it, my line. I think I said that. You did not <laughs> say that. <laughs> okay, general. <laughs> Inside joke. Um, uh, but. But you yeah. see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, it's vital to create that, that type of thing. But a lot of, a lot of companies just want to have the, have the dots and tittles, but they've, they've forgotten, man. Bottom line, business is done with people that you like. Mm -hmm. Sales, people buy from salespeople they like. Yeah. P like and, and salespeople work hard for people they mm -hmm. like. Yeah. And, and so, or at the very least, respect. Very least respect. Yeah. Um, but typically like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's why nobody works hard for you. I'm just <laughs> but even those times when they don't like you, which when you when you create a culture where people are open to discussing things that are going on, like even yeah. when they don't like you in that day or that week or that month, they still respect you enough to do True. what they're supposed to do. And you've seen a lot of people that don't like me, honestly. Yeah, like you different see. times where there's disagreements. Absolutely. And when you create an open culture to where people have the ability to express their disagreements, yep. which is a webinar that's uh, a whole podcast in on itself, <laughs> um, that's going to create friction at times, but it's that friction that enables you to say, okay, we disagree on this, but as long as we're still, and we'll talk about this, this idea of loyalty, as long as we're still headed down the same path with the same values, yep. then we can disagree on anything. But as long as we agree on these things, as long as we're, we're still, still locked up, ethics-wise and moral-wise yeah. and and value-wise, mm -hmm. we get through the little stuff. And when yeah. you can take people and put their sight on that, then it, then it, it the other stuff take it takes care of itself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you've seen people. You you have seen people that have violently disagreed with me. But we've yeah. created, and these are not. These are not my equals, mm -hmm. supposedly. Yeah. These are these are people that work for us. And have you ever seen me be punitive because because somebody disagrees with me? Mm -mm. Never, never, never. It doesn't happen. You have to create a culture where somebody feels good enough to go. I think that's a wrong move. Yeah. I think that's a wrong move. I think yep. you're or or you're like take Amanda, um, that works with us. She I can't tell you how many times she's called me and be like, you blew this. Like mm -hmm. you blew this. I feel like you blew this. This is what came across. Did yeah. you mean for it to come across that way, or is there something I'm not seeing? Mm -hmm. And most people would not feel that it was okay doing that. Yeah. And I want to hear that, right? Because number one, I may have meant for it to come across that way. Yeah. Or number two, I may not be aware. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to be aware. I think a big thing, um, especially when you're in a sales organization, is having the people at the top come from a sales background. Sure. Is critical, and that's and that's I think one been one of the biggest um, kind of pieces of putting this puzzle together for us is that at the end of the day, you have a tremendous amount of responsibility for the salesperson because you remember when it was you. Like when you yeah. said when you said something at boot camp, and you talked about like if there's ever an issue regarding your money where you didn't feel like a commission was paid out right or on time or there was something that was missing. Like, I don't care if I'm sitting at dinner with the President of the United States, 
if I get that text, I'm excusing myself from the table and yeah. calling to figure out why in the world you didn't get that 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 check 100%. or why in the world that check was a little bit off from what you thought it was. Even though you know that it's always there's a reason for these things, but if you didn't feel that way, like yeah, if you yeah. felt slighted and that something didn't get paid out or something happened that shouldn't have or, or didn't that should, um, that that's like code red for you yeah. because you remember what it was like waiting for those commission checks or sure. thinking it was going to be something and then receiving it and it being drastically lower oh, yeah. and what that does to your morale uh, and what that does for you to go out and produce the next week. And just like that's the belief in getting people bought in is that they know like 1,000% percent that from the top down that they've got their best interest at heart 100%. all the time. Um, but I think that becomes difficult for someone that comes from a background where they haven't done all those jobs. And so yeah. it's creating that those scenarios where they do go in the field and they do get a better understanding of what is it like to work on retention? What is it mm -hmm. like to work in this area, in this area, in this area? Almost like undercover boss, but like sure. doing that within your organization so oh, that yeah. you understand the pains that they go through and you can try to figure out ways to support um, each of those areas, I think, and, for and us has been you huge. Take, a perfect example is you take a salesperson that doesn't understand what somebody goes through calling, going through two, three, four, five, six hundred calls a day. Yeah. Here in the retention department, you, mm -hmm. you don't understand that, and they they make an error on something, and that salesperson calls mm -hmm. and just rips them a new one. Mm -hmm. You know, early on. Some of our salespeople were were like that. Yeah. They would be very combative with somebody, and it would leave somebody here just crying, yeah. right? And I've never dealt so swiftly outside of, of a commission problem and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, like one thing organizations have to realize is that there has to be, you have to deal with um, drama. <laughs> you have to cut it out like it's a cancer. Yeah. If there if it's a drama filled organization, mm -hmm. you just have to let people know on the front end, like when they're getting started with you, like we don't tolerate drama. So mm -hmm. if you like to stir it up, then you're gonna stir your fucking ass out of here. Yeah. I mean Yeah, yeah. Sorry, blip that out. <laughs> you're gonna stir yourself on out of here because yeah. we're not gonna deal with it. Because if you're creating Save I mean, the drama for your mama. We all have <laughs> we all have family. You ever go on to Thanksgiving, right? And you have that one relative shows sure. up and they like to start some stuff. <laughs> they like to poke and prod. Yeah, yeah. Those people get rid of them, man. Yeah. In yeah, your yeah. family too. You can just have them killed. Or that. Um. <laughs> but I think but I think the reason why a majority of organizations deal with the drama is that they don't have that open lane of communication between the salesperson and the CEO. Yep. So when you can't go up with it, you have to go left and right with it. Oh yeah. That's the problem is within the organizations when you do have that, but you just don't communicate yep. that way, you choose to communicate that way. And that's when you know that what's being communicated is not real it's not and it's not something. It's because they know if they go this way with it that it's going to get shut down because what they're talking about is just completely ridiculous or, right. or not worth the time. So they have to go to someone else uh, with it. Um, but with that, I think if we want to start with values because I think. One more thing before yeah. we start with values. Yeah, I wanted to talk about the development of people. Mm -hmm. um, inside, inside, uh, people may disagree with me on this. But inside every human being, I believe that they want to be better than they are right now. Yes. I believe that every person, when you boil it down, they didn't wake up that morning and go, God, I'm going to haul off and get just much worse. <laughs> like, I want to just do a terrible thing today, much mm -hmm. worse than yesterday. Yep. I just want to proceed down this awful path. Yeah. Like, I believe that inside all of us, we want to get better and better and better. Mm -hmm. And so I took it on as a mantle. Um, in helping people grow. Yeah. So we have books that we read organization wide, yeah. right? And it's not just here have this book read this month. No, we're going to all talk about it. Yeah. What did you get out of it? And and do you remember we we started reading uh, Les Giblin's uh, Skill with People. Mm -hmm. That tiny little pamphlet. It's a great book. Yeah. It's a great book. And it was shocking to see the view of some people on that book. Hmm. And I don't know if you were sitting in when we were all discussing it as an organization, but some people were like, they saw it as a, as a manipulation thing of people. Hmm. And it was really fascinating yeah. to go through because you don't see people as they are. You see people as you are. Hmm. And so it was a great thing yeah. to be able to sit with those people 
and walk through what they were mm -hmm. seeing and for them to realize that they were seeing the world in that book through their yeah. shit colored glasses. Yeah. It was who they were, right? And they were able to take those glasses off hmm. and get better and better and yeah. better. And uh, and so if people if if you invest the time and effort and energy in them developing them and see what what a lot of companies don't want is they don't want the janitor to uh, to want to progress. Yeah. Right? They want them to just be the janitor for mm -hmm. And here, I don't care where you start, I want you to progress. Yeah. And if progression means going to a different company and doing something different that's that lights your fire, yeah. then so be it. I had a hand in helping you do that, and that's good enough for me. And that alone creates a culture that not only is rare, it's almost non-existent in corporate it, America. It is. Um, where someone can truly say that if you leave and, and, and go on to be build bigger and better things than me, that that makes me feel and look better. Yeah, I love it. Like not, I wanna train people and I wanna help them develop as long as they stay about here, that's cool with me. And if they go beyond, well, screw them. It's like, no, if they go beyond, like how much of an incredible job do we do yep. developing them and how awesome is that for them? Oh yeah. But that comes down to like actually, actually, actually caring about, actually the, individual. Caring about the individual. Because a lot of people want to have the appearance of caring about the individual, but at the end of the day, they could care less. It's just about right. the bottom line. And see, the, the, the thing that people will say, and this is a dangerous thing, it's a nice, great little saying that people say, the best thing about building a company is the people. <laughs> and the worst thing about building a company is the people. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? It's not the worst thing. We're humans. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. like we come with our we come with our good stuff and our bad stuff. Mm -hmm. And so if you really care for the individual, there's nothing bad about that. Everybody has their stuff, yeah. right? And to help them go from where they are now to where they want to be mm -hmm. is if you care about that, you'll truly have a company that's worth that's worth being a part of. Yeah. Absolutely. And the values. You were going into yeah, the Yeah, so I mean, just looking at values, because I think as you and a lot of people that are listening to this, they may not feel that uh, corporate culture uh, within their organization, or they may run an organization they don't feel like they have that uh, developed yet. And I think the very first thing that they can do is try to identify what their actual values are yeah. personally and then as an organization. So a couple things I wrote down here. Um, so the good next step is clarifying culture with clear. Yeah, and clarifying culture is to define the core values. Getting clear on your organization's value means saying out loud what's important to you about how you conduct business and interact with each other. And then figuring out how to live those values. So you know, when you're working with groups, we ask, you know, they, this group asks them to complete the following sentence as a way to start talking about their values. We care deeply about blank. It's how we want to do business. So we care deeply about and then just figure out what that is. And this isn't something that like, the first thing that comes to your head, it's not one of those kind of, <laughs> right, one right. of those kind of things. It's like, Because Tyler's no. would be, my beard. <laughs> yeah. We care about my beard and puppies, TJ's hair. Puppies. <laughs> puppies. <laughs> Puppy. But it's something oh, to, spend, up, to, to, spend, to spend some actual time on. Um, so then what do those values mean? So the next step is, in clarifying your culture, is to figure out and state what those values will look like in daily life. How do you want them to show up as patterns of accepted behaviors? Yeah. And so that's something that I think we can talk about within the values of our organization is, is they were clearly defined, but then they took it the next step further in saying, well, how do those values show up on a daily basis right. in how we do business? And so with our values being loyalty and responsibility, talk about kind of how you came up with that concept, I'm assuming it probably, because we don't even know the answer, like it probably didn't happen like split second, like, oh, loyalty and responsibility, that's it, write that down. <laughs> no, it was I, probably something that developed over time. I, I feel like that everything, that, uh, that all the values stem from those two for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and people go over responsibility. You know what kind of what kind of value is that? And 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 like we always talk about, the lack of it's a cancer in this country. It's a cancer worldwide. Yeah. I'm tired of people not taking responsibility, but I'm actually kind of glad that it's such a it's such a uh, uh, the lack of it is so prevalent because yeah. because we really don't have to be that responsible to be head and shoulders above sure. everybody else. True. And uh, and so, but personal responsibility, and this has to do with caring for the individual again. I picked values that would help them if they left here. If they adhere to those values, 
like they're going to have a great life. Yeah. And and responsibility is literally looking in the mirror and going, hey, you, you're where you're at right now. It's all your fault. Mm -hmm. Everything you are, good and bad, hey, that you chose it. Yep. So take responsibility for it. And if you're in a bad situation, get yourself out of it, mm -hmm. right? You can take responsibility for it and absolutely get yourself out of it. Quit being a victim. Yeah. If you are pointing blame towards anyone else for where you are, then you literally, if I'm blaming Tyler, I just put handcuffs on and I need Tyler yeah. to get me out of the situation. Yeah. Because I can't do it myself if I'm blaming Tyler. That's what blame is. Mm. But once I go, it's your fault, the handcuffs fall off, and I can get myself out of the situation, whatever it is. And so responsibility, I think, uh, uh, once you take it for yourself, mm -hmm. once you take it for your family, it's personal, then you take it at work, you yeah. take it at, you take it uh, in your household, in your community, and, and literally it's like a growing thing. Yeah. You know, now as a company, we take responsibility for three quarters of a million meals mm -hmm. that we feed people that don't have access to food, yeah. right? So it didn't start with that. It didn't one day go, I didn't one day at the end of the year go, well, I need some tax write-off, I'm gonna feed some people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That yeah. wasn't it. Yeah. Man, I fed my family first, I fed myself first. Yep. And then as, we, as I took responsibility, and just using food as the example, you know, we started helping others, and I started teaching others to eat and teaching others. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Like it's a, it's a growing thing. And, um, and financially, once you took care of yourself financially, yeah, yeah. then it gave you the ability to look up and see those around you with an opportunity Absolutely. To see, like, well, how many more people can we have make this transition like we just did over the last couple of years? Yep. And then when I came on board, once I could take care of myself, finally, then it was, well, how many other people can we recruit into this same system that I can watch go through the exact same transformation yep. and see their life blessed because of it? Um, and that's when it goes from, you know, the idea of going from your head to your heart. But it comes being about me to being about how can we enable others to do the same thing. Right. Others that are aligned with these same, right. these same things. And responsibility, it bleeds into everything, not just money, yeah. oh, right? Yeah. Like if, if take responsibility for your, for your relationships, take responsibility as a dad, as yeah. a mom. Yeah. Why are you hiding from that? Why are you shirking that? Mm -hmm. Why are you not taking responsibility there? You're raising a generation of people that will fall off and take no responsibility mm -hmm. too, yeah. unless they see you do it. And so it's, that's why I picked responsibility, man. Yeah, it's interesting, kind of as you were talking, I don't know if it, I've never heard anybody talk about this. You were we, off in La La Land thinking about other stuff? <laughs> no, no. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's this, this idea of like, we always talk about the whole like looking yourself in the mirror and everything's your fault. And I think every time we talk about that or every time anyone hears that topic discussed, it's always the bad stuff. But I think there's an interesting angle on that is like the good stuff as well figuring like understanding that no that was you yeah like there's a lot of times in my life over the last three years that you know having a massive transition of of going from being broke to having money and going from being in a place where I had failed and failed and failed to now succeeding that there were times where I didn't take full responsibility of that change. No, people are like, think it's lucky. Yeah, like all of a sudden, like, well, like, thank well, goodness like, the thank, God smiled on me. Yeah, I mean, I, but I think a lot of that, you. there's a lot of power in taking ownership and responsibility of, of the good stuff. It's like, 100%. hey, because someone right now is watching this and they're looking at themselves in the mirror and it's not a bad picture. Like, they're in a pretty good place. Like, yeah. they're, they're making good money. Their relationships are intact. They're they're healthy. You know all these things that they, that they've got in place, and they may think to themselves like, oh, okay, I can tune out at this point. Like mm -hmm. that, they're talking about the people that are in a bad place. But there's a whole other aspect to taking personal responsibility of the fact that you got yourself there. Yeah. Like like you did that. Like yep. it wasn't the opportunity. Yes, you had to have an opportunity, but yep. like you had to insert. Yeah. massive effort into yeah. whatever it is that created the situation the that thing. you're in that's good. That success that you've had and where you are now, mm -hmm. if you don't take responsibility for it, it's your ceiling. 
Yeah, exactly. If you do take responsibility sure. for it, it's a springboard to more. Well, and it's the exact same thing you said. It's, it's the handcuffs. Yeah. Like, if I said that, like, well, Joseph created this opportunity. <laughs> I, I was going to cross I'm your hands and put them in hand. <laughs> you want to hold my hand? I don't. You want to play slap? No. I do, because I'll wear you out. I'm fast as lightning. I just want to see Good. if you would touch on it. <laughs> Got it. Oh, yes. <laughs> but that's the exact same thing. It's like if I say, well, Joseph created this opportunity, and, man, I'm just, like, so lucky that I've had success, but it was all Joseph. Mm -hmm. By not taking responsibility for, for my input of hard work and being able to actually do the daily tasks and do the weekly and monthly and set goals and be able to accomplish the things that I did, I'm allowing you to control the future successes right. above and beyond, but realizing that you like- You just let me handcuff you. Yeah. And I, mean, I didn't do it, and, you and, did and if And if you stay in that mentality, then you are the only person that can get me to the next level. That's right. Like you are the only person that can say, okay, Tyler, how much more money do you want to make this year? And how much money, more money do you yep. want to make this year? Until you take personal responsibility for your failures and your successes. That's right. Then that person has the same handcuffs on you. And that's a yeah, very I interesting I didn't thing. write those 7,500 policies you wrote in three yeah. years. Yeah, you exactly. Yeah, you yeah. worked on that. Yeah. You busted your ass. But I think someone coming from a, a period of of failure after failure that has some success yep. has the propensity to, to feel that way. Uh, to feel like, well, I'm still that guy that, that failed, failed, mm -hmm. failed. I just happened to find something that I didn't fail at. Right. Uh, versus, no, I actually made a transition, made a switch, and I put in the effort, and I got a result, and now what can I make that what can I turn that into? Now, how did you do that, and how can you apply it to the next thing, and the and, next and thing, teach and the next thing, the and thing. teach others to do the same thing? Yeah, that's that's exactly that's it. That's it. Um, loyalty. How did yep. I pick that one? Mm. Is because I, I got so tired of legit. Actually, I wanted to build like a mafia type organization, not illegal, but yeah. that took care of each other like La Familia, mm -hmm. right? Like your family. And, and I got so tired of organizations requiring people to be loyal to a person, yeah. like a boss requiring this sales guy to be loyal to him. Mm -hmm. Like, don't you say anything about this because that'll make me look bad to the other guys and all this stuff. You got to yeah. be loyal to me, all this stuff. Like, I don't believe in it to begin with. I think that, that if you can find a person or a group of people that adhere to the same ethics and morals and values that you do, and align with where you're going, then by default, that's loyal. Tyler and I, I was not loyal to him when he started. He wasn't loyal to me. We were loyal to the same thing, the same mission, vision, values, and the same code of ethics and morals. Yeah. So as we're loyal to that together, and we walk that same path, trust is built, and trust is the bridge to personal loyalty, yeah. right? And that is a very, very, very special thing. Personal loyalty is a very special thing, and once it's developed, you need to guard that. And that's the type of organization that we're building, yeah. a La Familia organization, a family-type organization where we look out for each other. We first, nobody knew is loyal to us. They're loyal yeah. to the mission, the vision, the values. And hell, sometimes they're not even loyal to that. Sometimes they just mm -hmm. need to make a paycheck because yeah. they're starving. Yep. And then they see how we are, and they mm -hmm. know, they start to understand that they're a part of something bigger than themselves. Yeah. And that's inside every human being, to be a part of something bigger than mm -hmm. themselves and to be accomplishing something greater than they could do on their own. So, And that's and that, in a way, is how you eliminate ego from yeah. in a corporate setting. It's, it's putting your own power and your own um, skill sets and things that you've developed and the successes that you've had aside and saying, no, like you don't, I don't want you to be loyal to me. Yeah. I don't, I don't need it. I don't want it. I want you to be loyal to the things that we're all loyal to. And if yep. you can do that, then I'll support you 1,000%. Yep. And I'll get you to where you need to go. And I think a lot of people in a CEO role or, or a management role, um, that that may be difficult for them to do. Like, you should do your job because I tell you to do your job. Right? Like, you should, you yeah. should, you should succeed because... That's just what you're supposed to do. Not mm -hmm. like, oh, let's talk about these other, like we don't ever talk, like 
all of our conversations on webinars, all of our conversations with agents, all of our conversations in, in these boot camp trainings and leadership trainings and Top Gun trainings and all these things we do, it's about an idea that's bigger than any one person. That's right. It's about this idea of everyone trying to just become the best version mm -hmm. of themselves. That's right. And that's what makes it easy when you say someone being able to get to a level where they then leave the organization, yeah. whether it's because their values changed or, or whatnot, there's no hard feelings in that mm -mm. situation. Not like you were all. talking about um, having a conversation with a guy that did leave yeah. um, and how you were helping him and giving him yeah. some advice and here, here's what I would do and maybe you should talk to this company and that company because he was no longer aligned with where we were going, where we were going. Yeah. but it doesn't make him a bad person, nope. and it doesn't it doesn't affect us in any way no. because we know that if he stayed, he wasn't going to contribute <laughs> to yeah. the organization because he was not aligned. Right, and it, it makes it to where you can make these decisions now that aren't based on emotions. Yep. they're based on things that have been outlined, and it's very very cut and dry. Like you're either aligned or not, yeah. and you can tell very, very quickly. Very quickly. Um, so it makes those decisions like like firing people or, yep. or, or uh, terminating a contract with someone. These are very yeah. like emotional things that like most management, most owners, they, they dread dealing with. I don't. But when it's very cut and dry, yeah. hey, you know, we talked about in the very when beginning. When do I fire somebody? When they've, when they have breached. First time I think about it. Yeah. I don't ever think of firing somebody unless because it's not unless they're no longer aligned with the organization. And yeah. the first time I think about it, that's the day they get fired. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, there's no, yeah. I don't, I don't. There's no qualms about it because yeah. any any day I was taught from a mentor, Roger, so that any day after the first time you think about it, they are stealing from you and mm -hmm. you are stealing their future. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, I don't want to steal somebody's future. And I dang sure don't want them to steal from me. Yeah. Right? But it's funny, you were talking about managers that, uh, what did you say, that just tell somebody to do something, yeah. just do it because I told you, yeah. that kind of thing, <laughs> instead of instead of creating the right culture and atmosphere for performance. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, those managers that do it like that, they're the same ones. This is what they're literally telling that person, is that if you just, if you just do it like I told you, you can have the scraps off my table and rest easy <laughs> in the shade of my massive ass ego. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's yeah. literally what they're saying to yeah. them, and uh, and that's so true. it just doesn't it doesn't work. Um, so, long so, term, it doesn't work. Yeah, and so another area that creates this culture is transparency, and this is yes. something that I feel with our organization has increased tremendously yeah. over the last like, year. Like you're almost invisible. You're so transparent. <laughs> I can actually see right through you. I can see through you. <laughs> but it's, it, it's something that you've become way more transparent. I've become way more transparent. All of us have become way more transparent. And it's interesting that when, when you look at transparency as a strength yep. and not as a weakness, like some of the things that we've talked about with our, our employees, with our Agents yeah. are things that aren't easy to talk about. Not comfortable. That don't shed a, a great light mm -hmm. on on us because of past you know things that have happened and, and things that we're currently dealing with and struggling with. But by opening up and discussing them, it makes you human mm -hmm. and it makes you real. And people want to be people want to be attached to others. Authentic. That are willing to be authentic and real. Yep. Um, Why do you think Oprah got so big, so, so yeah. big? I mean, that's what she did. Mm -hmm. She interviewed people and she was authentic and real with people. And that and people, everybody in this country has a craving for that. They're drawn yeah. to that. Um, yeah. So tra I mean, so transparency, I think, is key. And that's another obviously huge topic when you discuss ego within an organization. Sure. Um, that that's the reason why most aren't willing to do that. Um, but when they finally discover the fact that by doing so, they will actually become a stronger leader, yep. not a weaker le leader, yep. that, they're, that they're not exposing these things for people to say, oh, well, they have this skeleton in their closet, mm -hmm. that no, like by exposing those things, they have now become 
a stronger, it's like a superpower yep. uh, to be able to talk about what's really going on. We talk about these these ideas of dropping your rocks and mm -hmm. all these stories and, and literally taking people through this process yep. um, of just getting rid of all this baggage that they're that they're carrying around. Everybody's toting it around. Yeah, everybody's got stuff. Um, and then another area is giving people time to disconnect. So there's so many organizations that they want you to like work all the time and, and it's kind of like, I mean, just cracking a whip, like yeah. come in early, leave late, produce, 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 produce. But we've literally in the last few months have implemented structures so that people can work less. Yep. But, and not just work less in a, hey, you're gonna, we need, everyone needs to back off a little bit and that, yeah, that's gonna mean you don't make as much. But no, like actually trying to sit here and, and strategize ways to allow people to mm -hmm. work less and make more. Yeah, and I'm- Just by implementing things, structure. One of the things that we've done with our, with our agents is unbelievable, the way we've structured their thing and how they mm -hmm. get their time off. And it's, it's, yeah. that's unreal how that works. Yeah. But another thing in the office, uh, in our office environment is um, we have a lake house that we give everybody access to, yeah. right? We, we have a lake house that people have can go there about, what is it, two weeks a year? Yeah. Two weeks a year, each employee. Um, and then we do a trip at the end of the year to, you know, Dominican or Mexico or something mm -hmm. and all-inclusive and take the employees and their spouses. Yeah. Um, you know, things like that. We have the ping pong table in the office. We encourage people to take that break. We encourage people, make sure when you take your lunch break, man, don't do it at your desk. Get up and leave. Yeah. Like, like go disconnect from here because yeah. we care about the person, the individual, their happiness. Um, it just creates a better environment all yeah. the way around. So, yeah, absolutely. Except for you, you have to work. Yeah, I'm working. I'm working right now. I'm working right now. <laughs> no, but I think you've seen me do that more, though. Oh yeah, like absolutely. before, I didn't realize that was a problem in the office. Yeah. Early on, I gave people unlimited time off mm -hmm. before we grew to a place where we had to have certain certain things put in place. Yeah. Um, and no one would take the time. Hmm. Yeah. And I know now why that was because I never took time. Yeah. Like I work 24 seven and I unconsciously put that pressure on everyone around me, mm. everyone. Yeah. And, uh, and I probably would have burnt people out had I not realized, had I not been like, oh my God. Yeah. Like not only will I burn me out, it's but I'll burn like, this whole thing to the ground. It's almost like you had to institute mandatory time off. Yeah. Like you have to take a minimum of this. Yeah. Yep. And if you need more, yeah, it's like, but, a, but a minimum to make sure that they are taking care of themselves. And everywhere I started traveling, man, I met Germans and, and Australians, mm -hmm. Swedes, people from Switzerland. They have yeah. great time off with their, yeah. con with their Holiday. country companies, holidays, yeah. and, and it's just different. So I started trying to mimic some of the way those companies did it because these people were happy. Yeah. They were happy. And, and still there. Like they still there. You know, how long have you been with the company? Fifteen years. How long have you been with the company? Twenty years. Yeah. You don't see that crap no, in America. It's unheard of. It's no. unheard of, especially with millennials. Yeah. We had our first millennial leave in eight years the other day. Yeah. The first one that left for another job. Mm -hmm. The very first one. Yep. Um, and it was because it was time. Like it, it was. Yeah. It, we encouraged him. Um, and he cried. Yeah. You know, before he left because how much he's learned and how much yeah. this has meant to him, right? So I think that's a key thing to kind of close out on is is the fact that culture's always been important in corp in the corporate world, but never has it been more important and increasingly important than it is with millennials. Sure, um, millennials crave that culture. They create. They crave being part of a of something that's bigger than themselves. Yeah. They, they crave that environment. You know why? It's because everybody calls the generation, World War I and II generation, the greatest generation. Mm -hmm. And because they, this country was built on their back, yeah. right? And, and they sacrificed. It was a, it was a civil yeah. generation, yeah. right? They cared about their communities. Yeah. And if you look at the millennial generation, it, and generations go in cycles, the millennial generation is a civil generation. They care, like seriously, you can't talk to a millennial that doesn't have a cause. Yeah. Like f what, that's where the whole 1% movement came from. Mm -hmm. The 99% on Wall Street, that's where, and, yeah. and whether I like their cause or not, 
they by God will, will sacrifice for yeah. it. I mean, sure. that's where all the save the whale and save the baby seal. And yeah, yeah. that's what I, I mean. I had to quit bringing baby seals to the office and beating <laughs> them to death with a baseball bat. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Culture shot. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We never did anything like that. Um, but but they wanted a cause, and so you, companies need to give them a cause, and then yeah. they want to develop and grow. Yep. And a lot of times, it, it's it's not even that their job has to become more responsible. It's just they want to learn and educate, mm-hmm. so they can learn another job, or maybe they switch up in your company. So. Yeah. There's just different things you can do that uh, and incorporate them. Yeah, you know. And people are so so quick to to talk about millennials in in a negative connotation, but it is what it is. Like you can say anything you want about them, but you have to learn how to lead them, and you have to learn how to make them feel a part of an organization. You, you talk about it like away. you're not one. I, I, I'm aware. I know, and that's <laughs> and that's why that's why I understand it so much. And that's the and that's the key. And the fact that it is just because of the way math and procreation works, it's the largest. It generation. is the largest. It is large. <laughs> so it's not something that can be ignored. Yep. And it's something that. You hear every day, you could get on Google and you could read a thousand different articles on how to recruit and retain, and no one really understands, but it all comes down to culture well, and building a culture. You walk up in our office, I think we understand it. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, we, yeah, we've got definitely. it down pat. Yeah. But, and I hear, I hear my friends say that have companies in town and like, man, I hate millennials. They yeah. have this and that. They talk bad about them, and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm literally like, I love them. Yeah. I love their whole generation. Mm-hmm. I love what they stand for. I love every bit of it. I can't wait because my company will crush yours because yeah. you hate them. And that's like, a, if you don't but, change the way you feel. And that's just a decision. Never, like, yeah. That's all it is. Like, I just made a decision to love them, yep. and now I'm going to create a system that enables, that reinforces that love. That's right. <laughs> by creating a situation yeah. that they are creating an environment that they can thrive in. 100%. And when you create an environment where they can thrive in, then you will grow to love them because yep. they are some of the most passionate, really, um, really driven and educated groups that ever have. TJ. Except for TJ. TJ, he doesn't have much education. <laughs> are you a millennial? Yes. Or are you Gen I'm, X? So I'm, what is it? Gen, Gen Z. I'm officially considered a millennial because That's what I thought. I'm Barely. from 1982 to the year 2000. So I 2000. think they're like okay. 17 years old now is what they are? Is that is right? it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so 17 next, to... Because well, the next is Gen they're Z. They're literally is born that? in two, year 2000, so it's 2018. So yeah, okay. Yeah, they're 18. Yeah, so 18, 18 and 18 to, what are they now? 18 to, what, 82 was what? 82 would be 36. So yeah. 18 to 36. Yeah. 18 to 30. It's the largest, I mean, they're mm. huge. That's it's a huge generation. But if you think about that, the the greatest generation that I don't know if you did you say the word hierarchical? Did you say that? Like about as far as about the, you and me? No, about <laughs> <laughs> about the greatest generation that ever lived. Like the fact that those the, that generation grew up in an environment where you did get up and you went to work and you did your job oh, and yeah. you didn't complain and you went home mm-hmm. and you had dinner and you went to sleep and you got up and didn't but matter their if cause, you were sick. Their cause was yeah. America and yeah. freedom and and building a democratic questioned. republic. There was, there was never questioned like loyalty. No. It was loyalty from day one just oh, yeah. for the job that was given to them. That's right. Um, That's because they went through the Great Depression. Yeah. Yeah, That's absolutely. because they they lived in times where <laughs> you mm-hmm. didn't eat, yep. and so it, it developed a different. And fifty years from now, or not fifty years from now, thirty years from now, we'll be hearing this conversation all over again about why Gen Z is is so terrible. Isn't that the next one, Gen Z? Generation Z. Is that the zombie apocalypse? Or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. Something like that. It, we'll probably think it is at that time, because then we'll yeah. complain about that, and you'll hear all yeah. these people like, "Oh, these people don't want to work." And then you'll it's have just, all the experts on Gen Z. It's just what we say all, all the time in our organization is that the only thing that's constant is change. Change. <laughs> you better and buckle you up to be able to. I guarantee to you one it. thing: things are are changing. That's it. But this all is man, something that we're going to be talking more and more about um, because it's something that I feel has been done the absolute best within our organization. Here, and Thor is going to make an appearance now, and Come he here. is the epitome of culture within Come this here. organization. There we go. <laughs> Just say hello to everybody. Say hello. He was snoozing. It's okay. <laughs> He's still sleeping like sitting here. 
Look, like he would fall right off the front he of the really stage would. if I didn't. He's know. like in a coma. <laughs> he is in a coma. He is so tired. He can, <laughs> he's trying so hard to. <laughs> his right eye is completely closed. Dude, what's wrong with you? You had played too hard today. <laughs> This is our culture. This is our culture. <laughs> All right, buddy. Let's go down again. That is our cortisol reducer in the office. Mm -hmm. That's right. But guys, with that, I uh, hope you enjoyed and hope you got something out of episode 71 on Thank creating you. culture. Um, Sales Wolves Podcast. My name is Tyler Harris. Joseph Caldwell. Thor. And <laughs> we are the Sales Wolves. Uh -huh.